Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we get started, are you thinking of creating a podcast or are you a podcast host already? As a podcast strategist, I can help you to launch or relaunch a purposeful and profitable podcast, which will inspire, entertain and educate a global audience. Simply book in a one-to-one call with me right now via the Calendly link in the show notes and together we'll focus on the purpose of your podcast. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Lizette Offley. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. And we were introduced by the wonderful, magical Mark Lee. He's a proper star. Uh Well, it's really great. And I'm looking forward to having him on the show. We were talking about why he hadn't been on the show yet. And it was an oversight on my part. So watch this space. You will be hearing all about Mark's why too as well. But we're we're here to listen to what it is you're up to right now. So tell us, Lizette, what are you up to? What am I up to right now? Well, I I feel as if I'm, as per usual, working very hard, lots of things going on at once. What am I doing right now? I'm Work-wise, I'm focusing on getting the word out there for my two programs. Um, As you know, one is all about passing exams. The other is is all about personal development. The passing exams thing is predominantly for professional services, often uh, financial advisors, whose experiences of exams is is taking the two or three exams several times each and, and not passing them. So what I do is I teach them how to learn, something we could all do with, I think, um, so that they get information into their head in super quick time and then they keep it there. So in in effect, they pass every exam with a score of 80 percent by doing less work. And they're quite happy about that. (laughs) Um, And at the other end of of the scale, because I help people use their brains to get even better results. So that's at one end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, I help people let go of things like procrastination, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, anxiety, all those sorts of things that that have them feel a glass ceiling get stuck in their lives at work in particular, to help them let go of all of those things, leaving them free then to to dive into whatever they would like to to jump into. And it, it's often women, it's not always women, but it's often women, especially at, at work, maybe in male uh, dominated environments. So, so I've been working very hard to get, get the message out so that people who would need me can hear that I'm here for them and that, that, that this stuff works. Fantastic. So essentially what you're advocating here through all your work is freedom. Yeah, freedom of choice. Yeah, because sometimes we have an idea of what we want, a very good idea of what we want, um, and yet somehow it's just not happening. And, and that's that's where I come in. It's what you don't know you don't know that very often is the missing link. And you find that people do know what they want. Uh, well, I was, as I was saying, I was thinking, of course, that's not everyone, is it? But yeah, a lot of people know. For example, take the first um, audience I mentioned. Um, in some, um, in some professions, if you get certain qualifications, you can pretty much guarantee it a much easier job to attract higher net worth clients, increase your income more easily. So they want to pass their exams and they know that that's not happening, that they have to do something differently. So, so, so it's yes, it's people who know what they want. Or, or for example, um, um, a recent conversation, um, a very successful woman, very successful woman who'd been offered a great job and she knows she can do it. And yet she hasn't actually taken the steps to take that job. So there's something in the way for her, something that has her stuck. So she knows what she wants and it's not happening. And you mentioned the glass ceiling. Is that still a thing? Do you know what? I think it is, unfortunately. I really think it is. From the conversations that I have every day, it does sound like it. And is it for women or men too? In my experience, definitely for both. But it's often women who, for example, they feel guilty. 
that they're spending so much time at work neglecting their families. They feel guilty when they're at home with their families because there's stuff at work that needs doing. I don't often hear men talk about feeling guilty and being pulled in those two directions. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. And I'm not saying that other things like the imposter syndrome and the anxiety and all those sorts of things don't occur for men too, because they do. And I talk to men, um, you know, every week. I know that those men exist. And I have to say, it, it's very often the women who feel stuck. So this feeling of being stuck and that there's something in the way that there's a block and you've got the issues that manifest in the procrastination, the perfectionism, the anxiety and the imposter syndrome. Are, are those not the blocks? Those are nature's way of keeping us safe. You know, we've evolved to have those thoughts and those feelings. They're there for a reason. The, the problem is perhaps in paying the wrong sort of attention to those thoughts and those feelings. They're there for a reason. You can't pretend they're not there. You know, good luck with that. Um, it, if you try to push through those things, it's utterly exhausting and not good for your health. If you're stopped by those things, it's not good for the soul. It's not much fun staying stuck and feeling like there's something wrong with you. But they are they are nature's way of trying to keep you safe. And if you understand why your brain is manifesting those thoughts and feelings, if you understand what your brain is trying to achieve for you and with you by giving you those thoughts and feelings and you understand what to do with them, it means you can make healthy decisions. You can move forward safely. And that feels better than being stuck or fighting your way forward, especially for women, you know, there are differences between men and women, not as many as perhaps some people would like, um, like to think, but there are some differences. We know, for example, that the stress hormone dissipates. Um, it takes time to dissipate. We also know that if we keep getting ourselves wound up and stressed, then our bodies ultimately can't cope with that level of stress all the time. Men are actually better at dealing with an emergency quickly and then getting back, back to normal and forgetting all about it. Women are less, and look, I'm generalizing like mad here, but women can often be less able to let go of the stress. So they're just as capable of dealing with an emergency, but it can take longer for them to stop thinking about it and worrying about it after the event, which just means we're in a constant state of anxiety waiting for the next bomb to drop. So, you know, it's just not good for us. So if we, we have better ways of coping, then we've, we've got to be healthier and happier and make better decisions for ourselves and the people we care about. And you said that you're spending a lot of time at the moment getting your word out there. And is it the people's souls that are listening to your words that you're sharing or is it their, their brains? <laughs> well, at least we know where the brain is. I'm not sure if we've decided where the soul is just yet. I mean, that, we have um, apparently there have been experiments um, weighing people before and after death to see you know, where the soul has gone, where us has gone. Um, so I can't possibly answer that, except that I have, I have, on, on, we're all on a spectrum of, you know, female, male, and I'm a little way down towards the male side. If you count um, the way that I think about things in a structured and a process driven um, way. And so probably the way that I talk and the people who are attracted to me are probably those who like structure, step by step processes plug yourself in, guarantee coming out the other end with X, Y, Z. I'm likely to appeal to those people. Plenty of women like to feel like they don't have to worry about how it works, what to do next. So some people try to tackle a problem by knowing the answer already. And if they don't know the answer already, they won't approach the problem. Other people will recognize a problem and start investigating how or what options there are for moving forward. And I think it's those people who are more open to a process. If this process has worked for other people, if it's a tried and tested process, if it's got structure to it, because with, with all of my 
fantastic training, world-class training, amazing opportunities that I've taken advantage of and the experience I've had, the success I've had with, with different people in different circumstances, different backgrounds. I've turned what I've learned and what works with people into a step-by-step -step structure. You know, when I was teaching at school, um, I was teaching in schools for 20 years. I didn't turn up into a classroom and kind of wonder about what I was going to do with the class. I'd already worked out the structure, what we were going to cover over the next, say, four or five weeks in this particular topic. And while every class is different and you have to treat each class differently and each individual in the class differently, of course, you still have to get them from A to B. And that means you have to cover certain things and they have to learn certain skills. So that's my approach, really. And you've touched on the how, you touched on the what. Let's focus on why for a moment. Nicely Tell me, done. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me about the purpose in your life, Lizette. Um, maybe it's, it's so ingrained and so obvious. It's, it takes a question like that to have me actually consider that, to, to be in touch with it again. I think for as far back as I can remember, I've loved, I've loved the idea of learning, of teaching yourself, teaching someone else to do something, to be something, to have something they didn't have or do or be before, that they can now do something they couldn't do before. They now have access to something they didn't have before. It's that aha moment, the breakthrough from where you are now to something new, something better, something interesting, something that gives you more options. And I guess that's what attracted me into the teaching profession in the first place. When I used to, <laughs> when I was very young, I used to teach my teddy bears everything they know. You know, it started at a very young age. And I'm not surprised because my mum's a teacher. And so probably I picked it up from, from what I was noticing around me. My, my brother's a tennis coach, so he's a teacher as well. So I think it, it was in the family. But the idea that you can learn and grow and keep moving forward, and that's kind of what lights me up. And then being part of that with someone else to help them have those, those insights, those aha moments, those paradigm shifts, breaking through to the next level and seeing the joy that they're experiencing. That's just great. And I guess that's what gets me out of bed every day. And knowing that learning and growing is the default purpose for us as humans. And, and as a, if we don't do anything more specific than just learning and growing as we, as we go along in our life, taking that to the next level by then passing on that knowledge that you've acquired and applying it and, and getting that fulfillment and contribution from that experience. What's to come? What will continue your journey, Lisette? That's a good question, because I guess I'm thinking of it in terms of more of the same. And I guess the difference is continuing to make that difference with more people is the thing that will, will have me grow and feel even more satisfied. There's, there's, there are so many people that I meet who aren't quite satisfied with their lives. They've got something missing or something they don't want. And they seem to believe that that's how it is for them. It could even be, it could either be that that's just how the world is. That's just how I am. It's just how they are. It could be that they feel as if they've tried everything and nothing works. And for me, that's, that's a tragedy because it, it's what you don't know, you don't know is the thing that just might be the thing that works for you. But I completely get the exhaustion and frustration of, of trying and trying and trying and trying. So I guess to answer your question, really, it's, it's just to, for me to have a breakthrough perhaps in having more people learn what I've learned <laughs> later in life 
for myself and professionally, learn that at a much earlier age so they've got their options opening up for them right from the get-go. That, that would really transform my, my vision. And do you see, you mentioned you have world-class training and it's been fantastic in, in that respect. Share with us what some of the world-class training is that you've experienced. Well, that's, a, that's yes, I understand that's quite a, 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 a way to describe it. It is world-class training. Up until about 40 or so years ago, where psychology was, you know, the study of the brain, was, was all about, you know, we've all heard of Freud. It was, it was all about how we can be dysfunctional. It was all about where we can go wrong and we can suffer. And then people like um, uh, John Grinder and Richard Bandler came along and then others followed in their footsteps and they just got the idea. How about studying really effective, really functional people and see if we can observe what makes them really high functioning individuals? What are they doing differently from the rest of us? What do they do to get the results that they get? And if we did something similar, would we get similar results? And of course, that the whole world of NLP and new code NLP and cognitive behavioral therapy and, and lots of other positive psychologies and studies of how we do things emerged from that over the last 40 years or so. And I have been very, very fortunate to have loads and loads of training over the years from those very people at the very top of their game who have been there for many, many years. And world-class training because they come from all over the world and I have traveled to places to go and get the benefit of their training. And then of course I've brought back and implemented what I've learned and just watched the results, which can be really quite staggering. Our potential is huge. And sometimes we just don't realize it. So from teddy bears to children to <laughs> financial advisors, <laughs> who, who've been your best learners? Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. That's an impossible question to answer. It, the, the other question I'm often asked is, when you were teaching, what did you prefer, little people or big people? And the answer is they're people. They're people. And I have such a blast with the people that I help, but that I don't even think about, you know, what profession they are or whether they're a woman or a man or a teenager or, you know, it, it's irrelevant. They're, they're a human being and we're communicating and we're, we're doing our thing. It's great fun. It works. So I couldn't possibly tell you who, who the best learners are. I, I suppose the ones who are the most engaged and the most motivated, the ones who are having the most fun. But that's my job. Yeah, well, you haven't got into the animal world yet, teaching animals and training animals. Um, I think you could say that's true. <laughs> I think I, I'm just racking my brain for, you know, if, if I've ever taught an animal any tricks, I don't think so. Yeah, there's a lot to be learned from that. I, I do a lot of spaniel training and it's it's a fabulous, rewarding way of of communication in a different way because like yourself I'm, I'm trained in NLP and I study linguistics at university so removing language albeit that you do have simple commands and you use those but a lot of it is is the is the, the hand commands and the, and the but it's a discipline and it comes down to really having the clarity and that's what I'm hearing about what you're sharing here is that you have a way of simplifying the complex and you bring clarity to your situations. I do, yes, I, I, that's my intention. And that's often how I approach life and problems and challenges, is try to cut through to what actually is happening here and then find out what are actually the options. What options could come out of this and then to perhaps explore some or all of those to see what the possible or likely outcome would be to try and simplify everything. It's far too easy, far too easy to get lost in the mire, to feel overwhelmed. And, you know, don't get me wrong, there are times when I feel overwhelmed, but perhaps I'm able to recover from that 
faster than I used to when I was younger because I now have the tools and techniques to understand what's going on and what I need and they make healthy decisions and take those actions so that I can get myself from where I am to where I need to be. But yeah, simplifying things. Why overcomplicate things? When, when I'm teaching um, when I'm teaching people how to learn, and don't get me wrong, we're all great learners. We are all great learners, but nobody ever teaches you how to learn the sort of stuff you get in textbooks. So that's that's where I come in because most people do what they know. They don't do what works. When what they do doesn't work, they try even harder and guess what? That doesn't work either. So when I when I show somebody a really simple, really simple step-by-step -step thing they can do to get information into their head and keep it there. And they turn to me and they say, you mean that's all I have to do? And I look at them again and I say, well, does it work? And then say, yes, or no, in disbelief, yes. I said, well, why would you do anything else? If the simple thing works, why would you do anything else? you know we haven't got time in the day for any stuff and nonsense you know we're very busy people we've got lots of commitments lots of priorities i like to catch the chase yeah absolutely i love, love that so tell me more about the involvement that you've had with neuroscience with psychology in your work involvement well perhaps you'd be interested, although possibly not surprised, that I've also helped a number of people with very difficult medical conditions that doctors haven't been able to help with. Some things that I'd never heard of before. Things like focal dystonia and gastrointestinal reflux disease, as well as the anorexias and um, what else, um, Tourette's, and you know, a whole raft of things that conventional medicine hasn't got an answer for, all I've done is I've worked from a model which says that any behavior or outward manifestation, this in this case, you know, an outward manifestation as in behavior, or in this case, as what we would call a disease or an illness, is an attempt, an honest attempt to solve a problem. And if I can help that person's unconscious mind look for and find and then implement an even better solution to their problem that's good for them and is okay for everyone else, we've all been amazed at what's possible. Now, I don't know whether I can help someone. I don't know whether they really truly want to be helped or whether they're not ready to let go of the thing that they're doing or that they've got but but i just work from my model and what will be will be so for example there was a six foot seven 14 year old young man and it was all i could do to to not take a sharp intake of breath when i met him you know i didn't want to embarrass him but he was such a shock he was he was he was tall, he was young, but the point, at, the point is he was also extremely thin, very, very thin. And he'd had some, um, some problems when he was born, um, there were some parts of his digestive system that weren't working correctly. He had a series of, of operations and he'd now been given the all clear. But in the meantime, every time he ate something, he felt sick. This is historically. And so now that he was apparently fixed, he still couldn't eat food because it made him feel sick. So he had two options. One was to squash it down and throw it back up. The other was not to eat it. And his mother was beside herself with worry. And about, what, three days after he came to see me, I, I can't remember which one of them I heard from, but, but they'd been chatting while they were eating. And they glanced down and realized that while they'd been talking and eating, he'd eaten everything on his plate. The problem wasn't a problem, and he couldn't find the problem when he went to look for the problem. It was just a non-issue, and that was something that his unconscious mind has taken care, had taken care of all on its own by just simply asking the unconscious mind to go look for an even better solution. So I didn't need to know what his condition was, um, how it worked. Um, I didn't need to know all the medical stuff. I just worked from my model 
Anyway, I reckon that if you can help, if you can help extreme cases like that, then there's a lot to be said for for using your brain in even better ways to get better results right across the board. Absolutely, and, and incredible, and well done you for helping people in that way where they, they obviously felt that they were they were a lost cause, and and then they've found a, a solution through working with you, which is fantastic. I want to go back to the dysfunctional focus that we had for a, a period of time on the Freud way of thinking. And then obviously we've now become more obsessed with focusing on, on the highly functioning and the successful people to almost the detriment of learning from failure and, and not seeing how failure can serve us. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that, Lisette. Yeah, yeah. 20 years of teaching children in schools you never ever want to hear anyone saying to a child you can't do this you'll never do that you're not up to much you know the usual stuff that people complain about because that's so very very damaging because a child will believe you you tell them they can't do something they will believe you and that's that then they spend the rest of their lives either covering that up and overcompensating or just never going there and that's that's a tragedy but at the same time, unless you know where you are right now, how on earth are you going to get from there to where you want to go to? I liken it to, I don't know if they're still around, but do you remember there used to be um, maps in glass cases in the town centre? You'd press the button, a light would appear on the map saying, you are here. And that allowed you to, to find quite quickly on the map where you are so that you could then fathom out from that where on the map you intended to go to and then you could plot your course and I have met people who are dysfunctionally positive everything is positive they've read somewhere that you need to be positive and so they're hell-bent on being positive which means they're not actually looking at the fact that where they are is rubbish they didn't intend to be where they are and it really hurts but that's where they are and I would much rather somebody be realistic. Of course, this isn't where you intended to be. It is disappointing. You are hurt, but it is where you are. But the thing is, you can decide what happens next. It's not up to somebody else. It's up to you. It may not feel like it, but I then teach them you know, the insights and the tools to recognize where they are, what their options are, what they can do about it. So they can start moving forward. And of course that makes them feel better because they, they now feel as if they do have a say in their future instead of a victim of circumstances or other people. I really think it's important to be able to see the wood for the trees, to recognize what truly is and what's possible. And you know, that might take some time or to learn some new skills, but that's available for all of us. Absolutely. And I'm sure there'll be people who are listening right now who are thinking, I need that. that <laughs> I need I need to see the wood for the trees. I need to learn how to learn the simple way. What's the best way for people to reach out to you, Lisette? There are two main websites. If you are interested in, in knocking hours off time studying and passing every exam first time with a score of 80% by doing less work, you go to my Genius Material website, which is genius-material.com. If you're interested in personal development, personal competency, then it's geniusprinciples.com. So go to, go to either website, depending on what you're looking at, um, and you will see some information there and you will see there how to contact me. So it's genius-material.com or geniusprinciples.com. Fabulous. Well, they'll both be in the show notes so people can find Thank those you, really Tessa. easily. I just want to ask you about the genius branding, where that came from. I'm sure there's a little story behind that. Someone said to me, you're the genius maker. Because, of course, I do help people to use their brains to get better results, whether it's this or it's that. Um, and, and somebody else mentioned it. 
So uh, you're the genius maker. So when I thought about it, well, we're all geniuses. You see, I, I, I branded genius material because a lot of people start off thinking that the material is what I teach them. Uh-uh. You, you are the genius material. So, so that's it. You know, people discover that they can do these things with the right sort of help. We can move forward. People can actually achieve what they want to achieve. So that's where the branding comes from. I'm the genius maker. I love that someone else called it to you instead of it being a sort of self-named version. It has been a real pleasure hearing all about why you do what you do. Do you have some final words for us, please? Okay. Sometimes life isn't easy. Sometimes life throws challenges at us. and. I've had my challenges and struggles too. It's not, you know, that, that's just how it is. That's what happens. And I would just love everyone to know that just because things can be hard now, it doesn't mean that it's always going to stay that way. But actually, you have more options. You've always got more options than you think. And that with the right sort of help, you can break through wherever it is you are onto whatever it is that you want to do. So really that it's, it's don't put up with things the way they are, believing that that's it. This is the way I am. That's the way they are. That's the way the world is. That's how I fit into the world. Because, because you can change that. If you think that's fixed, that's an illusion that we're telling ourselves. We get plenty of people who will agree with us, but it's not true. You can make the changes you need to get the results that you need. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.